Hello and welcome to the HistoryNetwork.org podcast and the start of Season 28. The HistoryNetwork.org podcast, Season 28, Episode 1, The Battle for New York, Part 1. This episode was written by long-time contributor Michael Gaby-Gross. Michael received his master's degree in history from the California State University, Sacramento. His thesis project analysed the Phoenix Programme, a CIA counter-insurgency operation during the Vietnam War. Thanks, Michael, for this excellent script. The year 1776 began joyously for the American rebels. After the Battle of Bunker Hill and the subsequent Siege of Boston, the rebel army, now formally organised into the Continental Army, commanded by George Washington, successfully forced the British army under William Howe to withdraw from Boston and sail for Halifax, Nova Scotia. There Howe licked his wounds and awaited reinforcements. On July the 4th, 1776, the Second Continental Congress, the de facto government of the rebellious 13 colonies, voted to declare independence from the British Empire. The Continental Army, which spent the last several months constructing defences in and around New York, were encouraged by this dramatic step and their growing numbers eagerly awaited the arrival of the British. They would get their wish. By the end of 1776, the British had chased the decimated Continental Army out of New York and expected to crush the rebellion once and for all in the new year. What dramatically shifted the odds to Britain's favour was a campaign that saw the Americans lose battle after battle, and suffer thousands of casualties. All of Washington's plans were dashed and his abilities called into question by Congress and fellow officers alike. The Americans would not reclaim New York until the war ended, while the British victory at New York secured a base of operations from which to wage the war. The unwillingness to destroy the reeling Continental Army after New York ensured the war would continue and ultimately be lost. New York City had a population of around twenty to 25,000 at the start of the American War of Independence, making it the second largest city in the colonies behind Philadelphia. When Parliament announced the creation of the Stamp Act in 1765 to help pay for the Seven Years' War, New Yorkers filled the streets in an uproar. As night fell on November the 1st, a huge crowd formed, this time on the Common. The demonstrators included day labourers, shopkeepers, tavern owners, blacksmiths, carpenters and seamen, as well as wealthy merchants. The city was a centre of commerce and transit, making the Stamp Act especially painful to the city's business interests. While the working classes took direct action against the Stamp Act, the city's wealthiest used their influence to quietly encourage the repeal of the Stamp Act, especially since their tenants were suddenly unable or unwilling to pay their rents. The New York chapter of the Sons of Liberty, known as the Liberty Boys, began organising protests, built so-called Liberty Poles to show their defiance and urged boycotts of British goods. Despite these activities, New York maintained a large population of loyalists who were constantly at odds with the Liberty Boys. Washington understood the importance of New York City as a strategic post. John Adams reinforced this in a letter to the general. The vast importance of that city, province and the north, Hudson River, which is in it as it is the nexus of the northern and southern colonies, as a kind of key to the whole continent, no effort to secure it ought to be omitted. Washington sent General Charles Lee, veteran of the British Army during the Seven Years' War, to raise troops and survey the defences around New York. 
Lee instantly knew there was much work to be done. Since the Royal Navy would have command of the water, Lee assumed that the British would inevitably possess the city, but he also believed that they should be made to pay a high price for it. Lee planned to turn New York into a fortress, entice the British to attack and inflict heavy casualties. Lee drew up extensive plans of fortifications, covering key points throughout the bay. To the south, Lee ignored Staten Island, instead choosing to fortify Brooklyn Heights on Long Island. On Manhattan, the Americans constructed batteries along the shores to defend against British ships. Lee also had the streets of New York barricaded in case the fighting came down to street by street. On the northern point of Manhattan, guarding the Hudson Valley, Lee constructed two forts on either side of the Hudson River, Fort Constitution, later renamed Fort Lee, on the New Jersey side, and Fort Washington on the New York side. After several months in command at New York, Lee was ordered south, to assist in the defence of Charleston, South Carolina. Despite his departure, the Americans continued to follow Lee's plans. In April, Washington arrived on Manhattan to take personal command. The rest of the Continental Army soon followed. Following their withdrawal from Boston, the British, both in North America and back home, did not remain idle. George III and his ministers were unwilling to give up on the American colonies. The rebellion had gone on long enough. Reinforcements were sent to Halifax, including thousands of German soldiers collectively known as Hessians. The use of these foreign mercenaries, primarily from Hesse Kessel, became a source of ire and controversy. The Hessians were both hated and feared by the Americans. At the head of the British forces were the Howe brothers. Lord Richard Howe, the elder, commanded the British Navy in North America, while William Howe led the army. With the added numbers, the Howes felt confident they could bring this conflict to a successful conclusion. The Howes were also granted authority by Parliament to treat with the rebel Americans and to take measures for the restoration of peace with the colonies. The Howes hoped to avoid as much bloodshed as possible and hoped their overwhelming numbers would be enough to bring the Americans to the negotiation table. Their plan began with New York. Once they defeated Washington, the city could serve as headquarters for future British operations and as a port of supply and repair for the Navy. From there, General Howe was to link up with an army marching south from Canada, under the command of Sir Guy Carleton. With the two armies combined, the New England colonies would be cut off from the rest, and the rebellion would wither on the vine. Following the ratification of the Declaration of Independence on July the 4th, 1776, patriotic fervour swept through the now former colonies. The gold-leafed statue of George III in New York City was pulled down, his leaden head cut off to be melted into musket balls. On July the 9th, Washington, in a move to increase morale and remind his men what they fought for, ordered the declaration to be read aloud. The general hopes this important event will serve as a fresh incentive to every officer and soldier to act with fidelity and courage, as knowing that now the peace and safety of his country depends, under God, solely on the success of our arms. Men flock to their local militias to fight for independence. Joseph Plum Martin, then a 15-year-old new recruit in the Connecticut militia, wrote, I was told that the British army at that place was reinforced by 15,000 men. It made no alteration in my mind. I did not care if there had been 15 times 15,000. I should have gone just as soon as if there had been but 1,500. I never spent a thought about numbers. The Americans were invincible, in my opinion. Morale was at an all-time high and the Americans were itching for another fight with the British. 
Washington wrote his brother at the end of May, We expect a very bloody summer at New York and Canada. As it is there, I presume the grand efforts of the enemy will be aimed, and I am sorry to say that we are not either in men or arms prepared for it. In late June, the first masts of the British fleet were spotted on the horizon. A little over a week later, the first ships sailed unopposed past the Narrows, the water between Staten Island and Long Island, and began landing troops on Staten Island. The American lines were thrown into a frenzy as the enemy finally appeared after months of uncertainty. The Howes were not to be rushed, especially when there was still a chance for them to end the war with limited bloodshed. On July the 12th, Admiral Howe sought to test the American shore defences by sailing two ships up the Hudson River. American batteries blazed away at the ships, but the fire was ineffective, and the only casualties were on the American side when a battery exploded and killed its crew. The next day, confident their show of force proved the inevitability of the British victory, the Howes sent a letter to Washington with the intention of opening peace negotiations. After several attempts to pass the letter to Washington failed, due to the Howes' unwillingness to address Washington as general, an agreement was reached to meet with General Howe's adjunct. Any peace agreement was impossible, Washington explained, unless it included the provision of independence for the colonies. The Howe's authority was limited to offering pardons, of which Washington stated, those who have committed no fault want no pardon we are only defending what we deem our indisputable rights with that the adjunct left washington to report the negotiations of failure the problem with the defence of new york was its vastness there was too much ground to cover with such an inexperienced army Washington did not know where the Howe brothers planned to attack, therefore he had to stretch his army to cover every possible landing. Only when the Howes made their movements clear could Washington concentrate his army. Nathaniel Green, perhaps Washington's ablest general, was given command of the vital Brooklyn Heights defences. There Washington and Green hoped for a repeat of the Battle of Bunker Hill. The British infantry would march up the hill directly towards the American defences. This time the defenders would be properly supported by artillery, reinforcements and a network of redoubts with which to fall back to. General Howe's army continued to grow with more and more ships arriving. On August the 1st, Howe's second-in-command, General Henry Clinton arrived with several thousand men, disappointed with their defeat in South Carolina. The size of the British force began to shake the American resolve, as some began to doubt the ability and wisdom of defending New York against such a mighty foe. The Americans, and indeed many of the British, had never seen such a fleet of ships all in one place. Likewise, once General Howe's army had all arrived, it outnumbered even the peacetime population of Philadelphia. Illness, the ever-present scourge of armies in camp, hit the Americans hard. Thousands were struck down by the oppressive summer heat, dirty water, and an overall lack of cleanliness. General William Heath wrote, In almost every barn, stable, shed, and even under the fences and bushes, were the sick to be seen, whose countenances were but an index of the dejection of spirit and the distress they endured. Green became one unfortunate victim of fever. Bedridden, Green could no longer oversee the defences on Brooklyn Heights and had to be evacuated. This was terrible timing for Washington, as the British continued to land more troops on Staten Island. An attack could come at any time, and the general, with the most knowledge of the defences, was out of action. Washington first turned to General John Sullivan to command the heights, but after finding him lacking, Washington instead sent Israel Putnam, veteran of Bunker Hill, to replace Sullivan. The timing of losing Green and thousands of soldiers to fever could not have been worse, for General Howe, after almost two months of gathering his army, was finally on the move. The battle for New York had begun. <laughs> 
On August 22nd, Howe sent Clinton and over 4,000 soldiers to Long Island. The combined British Hessian force approached in flatboats and were covered by the guns of the British fleet. Lee's defensive plans, however, did not cover the southern shore of Long Island, and his successors did not choose to build fortifications in the area. Clinton's force landed unopposed and began marching north toward American lines, but Howe ordered Clinton not to attack. Howe, still haunted by the slaughter at Bunker Hill, was opposed to another frontal attack. He wanted to wait for reinforcements and scout for weaknesses in the American defences. Clinton took it upon himself to find that weakness. He learned from local loyalists that the Americans guarded three of the main passes towards Brooklyn. A fourth Jamaica pass was left inexplicably unguarded. Once he confirmed that report, Clinton rushed back to headquarters with the news. When Washington heard of the successful British landing on Long Island, he sent reinforcements from New York, but convinced that the main attack would be at New York, he kept the bulk of his forces in the city. Putnam, with no knowledge of the ground or the defences, held overall command on Long Island with around 9,000 men. William Alexander, known as Lord Stirling for his unrecognised claim to the title of Earl of Stirling, commanded the American right, while Sullivan commanded the left. Stirling, when he heard Jamaica Pass was unguarded, sent a handful of men on horseback to act as lookouts in case the British launched a flanking attack. He expected these lookouts to provide the proper warning to Sullivan should the British appear coming down that pass. Clinton planned just that. Never popular among his fellow officers at headquarters, Clinton knew he would have a hard time convincing Howe to accept his flanking attack. However, Howe's reluctance to attack the strongest points of the American line outweighed his dislike for Clinton. When no other officer presented a better strategy, Howe relented and adopted Clinton's plan. During the night of the 26th of August, Clinton led the vanguard of the attack, ordering his men to fix bayonets and keep their muskets unloaded. The British left their campfires burning and marched northeast, guided by loyalists unseen by the American lines. Behind Clinton were two columns under Lord Charles Cornwallis and Hugh Percy, ready to support Clinton. Clinton's column soon came upon the handful of men guarding the pass and captured them without firing a shot. The captured Americans confirmed they were the only ones defending Jamaica Pass. By dawn, half of the British army was now positioned on the exposed American flank and awaited the signal to begin the attack. That signal would come after a fight for watermelon. On the far side of the field, two British soldiers stumbled upon a watermelon patch belonging to an inn and gathered some fruit. American pickets discovered them and fired at the two British soldiers. The redcoats got away and reported the presence of the Americans to their officers. The British returned in greater numbers and a skirmish erupted. The Americans fled but were soon surrounded and captured. The British, under the command of General James Grant, decided to push north without orders to take advantage of the disordered enemy. Putnam, back on Brooklyn Heights, was alerted to Grant's attack, sent word to Washington and then rode to warn Stirling. Stirling, in turn, led two of his best regiments, the 1st Delaware and the 1st Maryland, to halt the British advance. Major Mordecai Gist, commanding the 1st Maryland, wrote, We began our march to the right at three o'clock in the morning with about 1,300 men, and about sunrise on our near approach to the ground discovered the enemy making up to it, and in a few minutes our advance parties began the attack. By dawn, and now outnumbered, American regiments formed into line to prepare to receive the British attack. Grant's forces pushed ahead with the support of the British artillery. One of Stirling's riflemen wrote, The enemy then advanced to us when Lord Stirling, who commanded us, immediately drew up in a line and offered battle in the true English taste. The British then advanced within about 300 yards of us, 
but when they perceived we stood their fire so coolly and resolutely, they declined coming any nearer, though treble our number. The two sides exchanged volleys with the Americans surprisingly holding their own. Both sides sent more men into the fight, and neither could advance. American marksmen carrying rifles aimed for British officers and caused confusion in the ranks. Sterling and his men were still unaware that this was not the main attack, and a great uproar was taking place on the American left. At nine o'clock, Howe ordered the signal guns to be fired. The Hessian troops, under the command of General Leopold Philip von Heister, constituted the centre of the British line. At the sound of the guns, the Hessians began their advance on Sullivan's front to hold the Americans in place as Clinton's men struck their flank. The sudden appearance of British troops on their flank shocked Sullivan's men. Expecting the attack from the Hessians, Clinton struck first, driving the American flank into confusion. Men began to flee, and Sullivan's entire force began to crumble. Sullivan rallied some of his men, but von Heister's men opened fire. Assailed on two sides, Sullivan's defences collapsed. Scores were captured, including Sullivan himself, who was attempting to save as many of his men as he could manage. To his credit, many of his men found their way to safety within the defences on Brooklyn Heights. With the American left out of the way, the entire British army could focus on Stirling's resilient but dwindling force. Washington arrived on Long Island in time to witness the collapse of his army. He observed Clinton's attack and Sullivan's men breaking, the sight of which caused him great shame. Months of planning and preparation had gone into the defence of Long Island, and it was all for naught. Sterling's men continued to hold, but Grant received reinforcements to push the Americans. The Hessians soon joined the fight, who finally forced Sterling back. The British then appeared in Sterling's rear, and the Americans had no choice but to flee. Sterling ordered all his men to make their way to Brooklyn Heights, except for a contingent of Maryland men from the 1st Maryland. The Marylanders were to stay behind and delay the British advance, so the rest of Sterling's men could escape to safety. Sterling remained behind with the Marylanders and led them in multiple charges against British positions around what is today called the Old Stone House. The remaining Marylanders, after suffering almost 50% casualties, at last were given the order to retreat. One American soldier wrote of the retreat, It is impossible for me to describe the confusion and horror of the scene, the artillery flying with the chains over horses' backs, our men running in almost every direction, and run which way they would, they were sure to meet the British or Hessians, and the enemy huzzahing when they took prisoners, making it truly a day of distress to the Americans. Lord Stirling, finding his retreat cut off and reluctant to be captured by the British, instead rode to the nearest Hessian officer to surrender. Washington, watching from the defences of Brooklyn Heights, exclaimed, Good God, what brave fellows I must this day lose! The British pursued the retreating Americans as they struggled for safety. Joseph Plum Martin described the scene. The British, having several field pieces stationed by a brick house, were pouring the canister and grape upon the Americans like a shower of hail. The Americans soon unlimbered their own guns and forced the British back. Despite his troops raring to continue the attack, Howe called for a halt to the advance before they reached the defences on Brooklyn Heights. It was a controversial decision and one that led to a sharp criticism among his generals and back in London. British skirmishers probed the American defences, but Howe refused to press further. Just as he wished to avoid a frontal attack against Sullivan's defences, he did not want to attack the more formidable defences on Brooklyn Heights. Washington said to Putnam, There is something exceedingly mysterious in the conduct of the enemy. The battle for Long Island was over. The Americans lost control of all Long Island and were trapped on Brooklyn Heights. It was a disastrous showing for the Continental Army. 
The British claimed to have inflicted close to 4,000 casualties, but the real number was roughly half of that. Three American generals were captured, Sullivan, Sterling and Nathaniel Woodhull, who would soon die in captivity from the wounds suffered on the battlefield. Washington still wished to contend for Long Island. He ordered over 1,000 more troops to make the journey across the East River to join in the defence of Brooklyn Heights. American artillery bombarded British lines to prevent the investment of their defences, but the Americans were in a perilous position. They were outnumbered, surrounded on three sides, and had the river at their back, which would be sealed off by the British Navy. Washington sent one of his best young officers, Thomas Mifflin, to scout the outer lines and determine if a successful defence could be made. Several days later, Mifflin reported back his opinion that the army should retreat immediately. Washington ordered General Heath in northern Manhattan to send all flat-bottom boats and ships south to Long Island. He then called a council with his generals, It was submitted to the consideration of the council whether under all circumstances it would not be eligible to leave Long Island and its dependencies and remove the army to New York. The decision was unanimous. The Continental Army would withdraw. The subsequent retreat to New York was one of the American miracles of the war. While Rains had fouled much of the army's ammunition, Washington still wished to make it appear he intended to stay and fight. He ordered his chief of artillery, Henry Knox, to maintain a steady fire on the British lines and informed his own troops to prepare for a night attack, lest they become further demoralised by retreat. During the night of the 29th of August, the retreat began. The sick and wounded were the first to move to Brooklyn Ferry. Then the soldiers withdrew from the defences, one brigade at a time. The move was done with the utmost silence. Muskets were unloaded. Talking was forbidden. The cannon wheels wrapped in rags to prevent noise. Private Martin later wrote, We were strictly enjoined not to speak or even cough while on the march, All orders were given from officer to officer and communicated to the men in whispers. Washington himself supervised the retreat, ensuring both secrecy and order was maintained. In the early morning hours of August 30th, Mifflin and his Pennsylvanian troops received word that it was their turn to evacuate. Mifflin, who volunteered to serve as the army's rear guard, was confused as there were still plenty of American units manning the defences. The messenger was insistent, and Mifflin reluctantly pulled his men back to begin the march for the ferry. Upon seeing the head of Mifflin's column, Washington questioned why these men were not still at their post. Mifflin soon arrived and explained they received orders to make their way to the ferry. There was now a huge gap in the American line, and if the British discovered it, they could destroy the Continental Army with ease. Washington exclaimed, Good God, General Mifflin, I am afraid you have ruined us. Mifflin and his Pennsylvanians made their way back to their defences as quickly and quietly as they could. The British were none the wiser. The evacuation proceeded, but not quickly enough. Dawn was fast approaching, and the Americans still needed to ferry boatloads of men and equipment across the river. They were running out of time. In another minor miracle for the Americans, a fog settled in and concealed the evacuation. British pickets began their morning routine of probing the American defences, but this morning they failed to encounter the enemy. As the reports filtered back to Howe, the British realised too late that the Americans were gone. At Brooklyn Ferry, Washington stayed behind until the last of his troops boarded the boats. At long last, Washington stepped off Long Island and made his journey to New York. Historian David McCullough wrote, In a single night, 9,000 troops had escaped across the river. Not a life was lost. The only men captured were three who had hung back to plunder. The Americans lived to fight another day, while the British readied themselves to deliver the fatal blow. 
The Howes believed New York could be won without further loss of life, and the British success on Long Island would force the errant rebels to the negotiation table. Lord Percy wrote, Everything seems to be over with them. I flatter myself that this campaign will put an end to the war. General Howe paroled Sullivan and tasked him with delivering a message to the Continental Congress. Washington allowed Sullivan to make his way to Philadelphia and present the British case for peace. Many congressmen found Sullivan naive in his belief that an agreement could be reached at this stage of the conflict, but they voted to send a delegation of John Adams, Benjamin Franklin and Edward Rutledge to meet with the Howe brothers on Staten Island. When the two delegations met on the 11th of September 1776, Admiral Howe did most of the talking. It is desirable to put a stop to these ruinous extremities, as well for the sake of our country as yours. Was there no way of treading back this step of independency? The irritable John Adams approved of the elegant table set by the British and the dinner of cold ham, tongue and mutton accompanied by a good claret, but he refused to engage in the discussions with the British without independence on the table. Admiral Howe then focused his attentions on Franklin and Rutledge, but they also required independence as a precondition of negotiations. The Howe brothers, however, did not have the power to accept such a measure, nor a willingness to do so. With neither side able to find common ground, they exchanged pleasantries and small talk, but nothing further. The American delegation returned to Philadelphia and reported to Congress that the peace conference was unsuccessful. And we will leave part one of the battle for New York just there. Join us again in a couple of weeks for part two of this great script by Michael Gaby Gross. If you would like to write a script for us, then drop us a line with your suggestion and we will get back in touch with you. If you'd like to become a patron of the podcast, go to patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash the History Network and see how you can become a patron there. Thanks once again to all our patrons who help make this podcast possible, and we look forward to bringing you the next episode soon. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to the History Network dot org podcast, written by Michael Gaby Gross, read by Nick Barker. <laughs>